Good day to everyone, to, to, the, to our Comita Explorers. We're back again on our 10th episode. Happy ako dahil uh, we're going to talk about the economy of the Philippines. Mm-hmm. And my guest today is syempre, a very special guest. And nasa good trajectory tayo from the latest news that I've read. No? 6.5% GDP growth. So from in my interpretation there, I think the Philippines is in a good trajectory. But we'll try to confirm that later, no, with our very special guest. I'll introduce the guest now. Um, he's from the academe. He's an economist, and also the dean of Ateneo John Gokongwe School of Management. I, I met him at uh, two of the events at the IBPAP. Uh, uh, events last year and this year, and prior to his appointment as dean last year, he was part of the World Bank uh, as senior private sector specialist. He led research studies and champion negotiated and implemented key economic development projects in uh, in the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia. And he's glad to also talk about M. You know SMEs in general and yung yung future in the Philippines, and just to give you a background, no, he has a PhD in management and MS in management from IESE Business School in Barcelona, MS in economics for development at Oxford. He has consulted with the private sector as well for nine years, a faculty member uh, of Ateneo de Manila and AIM previously. So that's just a preview. I would uh, like to bring our guest today, Dean Robert Martin Galang. Welcome. Thank you, Christian, and hello to all your viewers out there. All right. So before we start with the question, can you tell us more about yourself and what led (laughs) you to where you are now in your career and what's your focus this year? So... Thanks, Christiana, for inviting us to the show. So, yeah, so I'm the dean of the John Gokongwe School of Management here in Ateneo de Manila University. Uh, and so it's good to be back in the academe because I really started my career here in the academe, studying in Ateneo and then ending up teaching and working at AIM and then coming back to Ateneo a few years ago. Uh, and then I took uh, like a 10-year break of sorts no, uh, working for the World Bank and the International Finance Corporation. No? So it's always good to have that development orientation and that uh, you know and that academic footprint because it allows us to really bring in a lot of the work that you know the World Bank does into the classroom. Uh, and since you know I still do some consulting with the World Bank, parang it's also good to see the latest insights from the academic space uh, go and filter into the projects of the bank. So thank you again for having us here today. Thank you, thank you. Ito, when I was reading some of uh, the write-up when I was doing my, my research about the topic, I what caught my attention is when you said that the Philippines needs more, they need more disruptive entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Can you define what disruptive means in that context of your, of your speech or write-up? And what is a disruptive entrepreneur? So that's also one of the key thrusts that we have at Ateneo now, no? Because especially pagising natin from the pandemic, no? Uh, we quickly realized that the world around us had changed, no? And it's changed significantly. Uh, for example, before 2019, no? In the olden days na yung um, most transactions really done either cash or credit card, no? But now we have all sorts of digital payments. Even... We forget that even as late as 2019 and early 2020, you know, parang the concept of using an app to have food delivered to your house, mag grocery ka using an app, or even a sari sari store allowing you to pay via GCash, these were so strange. Uh, in fact, na, even working at the IFC at that time, I was talking about the, uh, the magic of GCash, no? Kasi nagamit namin siya, dinownload namin siya during one of our lunch breaks. And it's such a great way to do KKB para madali na yung hatian ng, pe, ng bayad, no? After nyo mag-lunch out. And people around me were like, saan ko gagamitin yan? What's this about? Uh, they downloaded it hesitantly. And then, wala. It wasn't very much use, no? In fact, when I went around the mall, 
back again no in the olden days 2019 parang when you ask to pay by paymaya or gcash the sales lady would look at you strange she was like ah ano yan and then they look through the back to find the QR code of course fast forward to the day you have people that don't even bring cash around talagang very dependent na sila on gcash uh, you can buy practically anything online so itong mga impact na to no, this is just a small part of the whole uh, dynamic change that has engulfed us no Um, and so the reason why this is so dynamic today is that parang naiwan kasi talaga ang Pilipinas in terms of innovation and disruption. So many of the ways we do business up to today, no, marami pang cheque, marami pang pen and paper. In fact, if you go to countries like in Europe, parang when you show a checkbook to them, parang ano yan. Uh, right? But here in the Philippines, it's still very much used, no, whether it's to pay rent, to pay suppliers, to pay to do payroll, para ang dami pa rin gumagamit ng cheque. So, we really need a lot of disruption kasi what the beauty of the pandemic, no, despite all the economic and social hardships that it generated, it really started this wave of digital transformation. Um, and so, what we need now, both in the academe and all over the country, no, are more people who will push for new ways of doing business harnessing uh, all of these digital tools that we have especially because you know you have major concerns primarily around you know uh, geopolitical issues uh, fuel shortages uh, climate change so talagang uh, we really need to rethink the way we do business and the philippines needs to play catch up especially with our neighbors no especially like indonesia singapore malaysia where matagal na talaga nilang ginagawa itong mga digital ways of doing business no at sa atin kasi uh, bagong bago lang siya so i think that's uh, where we really want to push our programs at ateneo and hopefully ateneo can become a beacon of you know coming up with new innovations both inside campus and of course with our students you know developing the the apps that will change the world yeah can you tell us about uh... Uh, the Ateneo JGSOM uh, school. Yeah. What makes okay. you different from other, you know, business schools? Yeah. Well, the John Gokongwe School of Management is one of five uh, schools of uh, Ateneo de Manila. No, so we have the premier programs in management. No, uh, especially some of the flagship programs like management engineering or management of applied chemistry or IT entrepreneurship. No. So uh, the thrust of uh, JG SOM is to really try to bridge different worlds. No, uh, management is one of our oldest programs. I think, nung Ateneo Municipal pa kami, no, in uh, intramuros ng panahon ni Rizal, no, business was one of the key things that we already taught. Uh, but fast forward to today, uh, parang the goal is to really come up with new and innovative programs and launch them, no. For example, when we launched management engineering now almost 50, more than 50 years ago, uh, parang putting together high-level mathematics and business courses in a single program was very unique and very groundbreaking. You know? And so now, for example, our IT entrepreneurship program is, uh, if not unique in the country, it's you know very groundbreaking. It, uh, it's, as it, it's the only uh, four-year degree program that's dedicated to create Uh, tech-enabled startups, no. So from start to finish, talagang you have uh, classes on coding, on market uh, valuation, on uh, financial analytics, really to help uh, create the firms of tomorrow, no. So I think uh, we're also looking at launching new programs over the next few years. But that's really the goal, no, to try to look for ano ba yung mga programs na kulang sa Pilipinas and try to create that space. No, so that we can create again the the movers and shakers of tomorrow. Oh, that's good. I want to go back to yung yung concept of disruption. No? What what comes mm-hmm. to mind when when I talk about or when I hear or when I think about disrupt disruptive entrepreneurs are you know startup enabled entrepreneurs right. in Silicon Valley or in Israel. Israel is like like has the largest number of startup entrepreneurs per capita in the world. Like I think it's like 6,000 startups per million people. So Dean, uh, bakit ganun kadaming disruptive entrepreneurs sa, you know, sa mga bansang yon? 
ano yung ano kaya yung reason behind such uh you know explosive uh, type of uh culture in terms of entrepreneurship sa, on those two countries what makes it yeah. you know, israel is relatively unique no kasi nga um they were able to really attract many uh you know migrants especially when the when Eastern Europe fell, and of course, even earlier, you know, when it was created after World War II. So, marami mga highly productive engineers, computer scientists, all flocked into Israel, no? Mm-hmm. Uh, especially, you know, when Russia went into a, in an economic crisis. And so, um, it has that unique uh, ecosystem in place so that it has very top-notch universities and then it has a lot of uh, these incubators, these uh, financiers, plus you have this uh, culture where, you know, because everyone has to serve in the army, but uh, everyone really gets a chance to meet each other, no? So that way, um, they really have a good way of ideating. Kasi nga, ang hirap sa Pilipinas, no? Um, we work in very exclusified environments. No, ano bisa bihin on ginawa ko lang word na yon. Um, kumbaga, if you are, you know, um, growing up, you generally are in, let's say, in an enclosed subdivision. You go to a school that's uh, very enclosed. Uh, you work with, you know, different people. Hindi as much yung mixing of different people from different walks of life. Uh, so I think that's what really makes Israel unique. But there's something about the Philippines because yeah, we have very few disruptors. And I think not just disruptors, no, we have very few SMEs, especially compared to other countries like Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, and Thailand. Because two reasons. So one is yung red tape kasi dito sobrang bigat. And I know your SME listeners uh, know about this. No? Um, that um, to set up a business here, Ang daming steps, uh, especially before, no, maybe a few years ago, where kailangan lima kayong incorporators, kailangan meron kang bank statement, uh, you have to go to BIR and then to SEC and then to the LGU. Parang ang dami daming steps. So hindi ka pa nag-uumpisa to set up. Um, you know, naubos na yung capital mo. And then second is that it's very hard to actually raise capital here, uh, especially in the past, no, kasi... Uh, the banks are really strict about the amount of collateral that you can get. Um, they don't use the business plan as a basis. Talagang kailangan mahanap ka ng collateral. Um, there's very few uh, angel investors. There's very few people who are willing to risk venture finance in order to, um, you know, to launch a business. So the limited access to finance and then, you know, the highly red tape within government bureaucracy was really making it difficult for startups to grow and start. So, kaya, um, even if you look at the Philippines, no, marami tayong micro-enterprises, pakonti ng pakonti yung small, medium, and especially large, kasi nga, ang hirap to grow from the one-person sari-sari store or karinderia and get the loans, the financing, and the, uh, you know, the support needed so that you can have three branches, five branches, and then become the disruptor. No, so I think that's really where uh, we need to, you know, put in a lot of resources to f- help improve our ecosystem, reduce the red tape, and of course find new avenues of finance so that people can get the financing that they need for their good ideas. You talked about you mga financing companies or uh, banks not willing to risk is that really how big of an uh factor is that no are we as a culture not risk takers or medyo gano lang more on the financial side lang kasi for in my experience parang when i talk to to fellow entrepreneurs and people who are in the professional field parang they want to you know, have a stable income <laughs> and, mm-hmm. you know, before really committing to the business. Unlike, you know, yung mga, it's a risk-driven type of uh, venture. What are your thoughts on uh, the risk-taking appetite of Filipinos in general? Well, I think we're relatively 
uh, risk takers naman, no? Um, because if you look at uh, the types of companies that, you know, get thought about, parang they're really in all the different fields. Um, so I, it's probably less a concept of risk, but more the fact that even if you wanted to take the risk, saan ka kukubuha ng pangkapital? In fact, na, um, you realize that if we were really a conservative country, no, we wouldn't be victims of all these financial scams and get rich quick soon uh, <laughs> scams, no. Because people are actually very much willing to place bets and make bets, and okay. many times, nga, nawawalan sila ng pera kasi they make bets on the wrong uh, businesses, no. And daming talagang scams sa Pilipinas. Um, so I don't know if it's a question of risk. Um, I think it's really a question of um, access to capital. Uh, mm-hmm. Especially capital na mahaba yung pasensya. Uh, because mm-hmm. if you are uh, an entrepreneur, um, especially if you think about how many restaurants open and close in a year, or how many you know new businesses fail in the first uh, two or three months even. Kasi it's very hard. Eh? So you really need to have patient capital that will allow you to swallow you know a few months or even a few years of you know, very limited or thin margins or even zero margins or even losses. Uh, so that's, I think, what's uh, really missing in the country. You know? There's not enough risk capital. Although, again, this is starting to change. You know? um, so the startup ecosystem in the country is growing. So I'm excited to Ateneo to play a role today and launch these new programs today because I think um, many people are starting to feel that the next big wave of startups will come from the Philippines. No? Uh, oh. So you have a lot of venture capital lists now looking at the Philippines, looking for pipeline, especially now that, you know, the other countries around us, especially Vietnam, Thailand, and Malaysia are maturing. So feeling nila dito lalabas. Yung mga disruptors, especially because our economy, sad to say, is still very backward in many cases. No, Our agricultural supply chains are still non-existent. Uh, many of our import-export uh, regulations really still require, you know, pen and paper submissions, um, and daming documentation and kailangan. So if we can really unlock some of these uh, frictions and have people really create the business models that can, you know, recreate the way we have our tourism industry, we have our transport industry, we have our, I don't know, um, construction industry. Parang ang dami talagang pwedeng mangyari. So that's why I think with our large economy, you know, we have 110 million people, uh, a very young population that's getting more and more tech savvy. Uh, malaking tulong din kasi yung pandemic to force people to open email accounts, to buy smartphones, right? To actually start using watching podcasts and going on Zoom and downloading Netflix and YouTube. So parang alam mo yon na talagang uh, it really opened uh, many people both the disruptors and the consumers to the magic of the digital enterprise. So hopefully uh, we'll start seeing more and more fintech, more and more edutech, more and more regulatory tech and all these different companies start springing out of the woodwork. Oh, that's good news. That's good news, no. Since you talked about yung economy natin, no. So we're, I'm going to go back to the to the news that I think we received like four days ago, mm-hmm. no? like six point four percent GDP growth. Is that good enough? No, given the inflation rate, natin, I think uh, in quarter one is around seven eight percent. Well, it's very good news, especially if you look at all the different uncertainties that are still around. No, unfortunately, COVID keeps rearing its head. No, uh, <laughs> so we had some the. Some di naman some mini outbreaks, no. But you know, even within Ateneo, a few of our faculty and our students got sick over the past few weeks. I mean, thankfully they're all mild. But at least you know that you know uh, this COVID disease, you know, it's still a lingering issue. Um, then you have, of course, the war in Ukraine that's still there. You have geopolitical tensions uh, coming up. No, and so mm-hmm. especially if you're a businessman, pag may uncertainty, um, gusto mo mag wait and see. So that's why you're seeing a lot of slowdown in many countries, no, in terms of their economic growth, kasi ang daming uncertainty, no, and daming um, things that we're not 
sure what will happen, including, of yep. course, climate change, which mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, will actually increase the vulnerability of our economy to stronger typhoons and droughts and floods. No, um, So, talaga, we're coming up with a very uncertain world. So, the fact mm -hmm. that we're still growing and growing at a pace that is now outpacing, you know, our ASEAN neighbors, including Vietnam. So, parang, this is really uh, great news, no? And so, hopefully, uh, especially with, you know, a new presidency, uh, mm -hmm. fresh set of, you know, government officials, hopefully they will keep pushing the reform agenda forward and really attract, make us more attractive to foreign investors. That's good. I think you mentioned kanina yung, yung young population natin. I think the average age of the Filipino population is around 23 to 25, no? last mm -hmm. time I checked. Yeah. Um, however, ito, may mga views yung mga ibe. No? Mm -hmm. uh, like Elon Musk is saying that total population, global population went down. It's bad. It's scary. Kasi yung global, syempre sa pandemic, takot. <laughs> takot right. yung tao. Nagtitipid eh. Diba? Right. Um, it, but some people are saying it's good that population is down. But some economists are saying, no, that's not good. What What's your view there, uh, Rob, Dean Rob? Well, population is a very complex uh, thing to study. no, And especially post-pandemic, parang we had this... Uh, population crash, no, in a sense that uh, people were expecting, at least the Population Commission was expecting, you know, a lot more unplanned pregnancies, for example, which of course didn't happen kasi, um, you know, sa dami ng pagdurusang dinaanan natin during the, <laughs> the lockdown, no? I mean, paano ka naman uh, magkakaroon <laughs> na magkaanap kung hindi ka nga makalabas ng bahay at baka yung, uh, yung asawa mo na trapped sa ibang lugar, no? which happened to many of our countrymen, unfortunately. So, um, and so we noticed that even post-pandemic, parang the birth rate of the Philippines has not gotten back to normal. But we don't know if this is just uh, a post-pandemic trend or we've now reached the point where, you know, the population will start slowing down at uh, aabot na tayo dun sa... I think what they call the demographic dividend. You no, know, when you start having, uh, you know, more and more people going into the workforce and less children that they need to support. You no, know? but of course we also know that once you also hit that other spot where the population starts to age or starts to decrease, like what you have in places like Korea, Japan. You no, know, of course, magkakaroon ng maraming disruptions na yon, and we're starting to feel it even at the neon. No. Um, we know that we are getting more and more visitors from universities abroad, no? Um, and we started looking, sino ba tong bumibisita sa amin? And we noticed that it's people in countries uh, like in Europe or Northern Asia na lumiliit na yung kanilang populations. So, syempre, ang unang tatamaan yan is the schooling system, especially the private schools. Kasi kung kukonti na yung sudyante na pinapanganak sa isang bansa, Obviously, kukonti rin yung uh, customers ng mga schools. So I think that's why they're reaching out to places like the Philippines and Indonesia where you have a lot of you know people that are looking for better ways of education. So this is good for our, our people kasi they're now offering a lot more scholarships. no? But it's not very good for us as Ateneo kasi syempre biglang lumawak yung uh, competition. No? Uh, as people are really looking for the best and the brightest students to study in their respective schools. So you're starting to see uh, na in places like the Philippines where we are now entering a positive population uh, shift uh, and also in the same continent where you have places like China, Korea, and Japan that are having, you know, a quickly aging population, population and all the problems that they'll be facing as you know you start lacking workers you start lacking customers in different um fields you no know, in different mm -hmm. industries so talagang um yun, it's a double edged sword but ang issue rin kasi is you know the resources of the planet is finite you no know? mm -hmm. um and so a lot of these issues on climate change is really due to the fact that exactly. talagang it's not just a population but the consumption that's generated by each person so we do know that we do have a resource constraint, no? Uh, isa lang planeta natin. Um, and I think we've extracted way too much carbon 
uh, and so hopefully uh, we can find that happy middle to you know find a way that our population continues to I mean not that global population kasi numero lang yun eh. it's more na every single individual here on earth has mm-hmm. the potential yeah. of you know having a fulfilled and successful life uh, so yun naman siya no? and you know we'll just deal with kung madami tayo or konti later on Dean Robbie, curious question. No? Will there be a power shift as a, in the you know in the ASEAN Asian region? Shemple, we talked about China, South Korea, mm-hmm. and Japan. Their population is at an I think declining at an alarming right. level. Mm-hmm. So will there be a power shift like in the Shemple? Dami nating tao, eh, Will there be a power shift? <laughs> Eventually, in, in terms of economy, not militarily, yeah. do you see that? Yeah, eventually, no. Uh, you're already seeing it because India has recently oh, overtaken yeah. China, no. Exactly. And so a lot of manufacturing is also moving there because in the market, no, lumilipat siya doon. Uh, of course, partly it's because of the U.S.-China conflict, also. No? But uh, firms are looking for a safer, quote unquote, area to do business, especially if you know the U.S.-China. Discussions start escalating into conflict, which na panood sa nanman hindi mangyare, kasi mm-hmm. nasa yeah. and dito tayo sa tabi. I hope not. So the Philippines will be badly hit if something like that were to happen. Um, so yes, there will be a shift. Um, but the thing, kasi with ASEAN, unlike India, no, um, India is one giant country. No? So you have a billion and a half people with all generate a, a single mechanism for immigration, for regulations. Although, syempre, magkakaiba yung mga rules in each Indian state. No, They're more federal than we are. Uh, but for the most part, iisang bansa siya. So, it's easier to create rules that apply to all, uh, restrictions that apply to all, kasi nga iisa siyang bansa. So, talagang madali magnify yung earning potential ng 1 billion people na yun. With ASEAN, uh, it's great no, because you also have you know, um, I, I'm trying to remember kung the total, no? But I think close to a billion people also. Um, but we're still separate markets. There's still 10 of us, no? And even if we talk about ASEAN integration, um, it's still very difficult to do cross-border businesses here, no? Uh, and daming restriction. If you're an engineer in the Philippines, you can't work in, in Indonesia. If you are a doctor in Cambodia, you can practice here. Um, if you are a company that has all the FDA licenses, for example, to sell food here, hindi ka naman pwede magbenta ng pagkain sa Malaysia until you get all their certifications in place. So because of all these frictions, it's not a real single market. Hindi siya parang EU, no? Uh, where talagang, you know, you can sell your egg in one place and another, no? How almost uh, equally, no? Even in many parts of the EU, iisa na nga yung currency niya. So we're very far from that. It's not clear that we will get there. So because of that, uh, you won't have that kind of, you know, we are a single ASEAN market type, no? Kahit na gano ka mark, kahit i-market to ng i-market ng ASEAN. No? Uh, the reality on the ground is that we still are 10 separate markets. No? Um, and there are many companies that are trying to bridge this. So for example, you have companies like, you know, Universal Rubina, that sells snack foods all across ASEAN. You have San Miguel that sells, you know, beer and food all across ASEAN. Petron is in multiple markets, even here, no? Uh, Copico is, you know, the number one brand in Indonesia and the Philippines. Uh, no, it's number one here, no, but not even in its home market. So you have things like that, no, where companies are cross-selling, you know, we, as tourists know, you now go to Bangkok for a weekend or to Bali. Para normal na siya, but it's still not, you know, seamless. And lumabas talaga during the pandemic where, you know, each country created its own rules. At, you know, if you get stuck in one country, bahala ka. <laughs> That's true. Eto, since we're talking about the ASEAN uh, neighbors natin, how would you rank yung economic maturity ng, ng isa? No? Mm. If there is such, uh, such a ranking. Well, of course, Singapore is uh, the most yeah. mature of the markets. No? It's the richest, the most developed. Even if it's very small, you know, it packs a uh, punch way above its 
population size. And nakikita mo naman talaga na highly sophisticated yung economy niya, no, na a lot of financial products exist there that don't exist here. Um, you know, just going to their airport, uh, you know, everything is seamless, everything is fast. Um, everything there is automated kasi nga mahal ang labor. Um, they really produce high-tech goods and many of their companies are world beaters. No, uh, Malaysia and Thailand are probably next in line there um, in terms of economic sophistication. Uh, you know, the auto industry in Thailand is very big, uh, especially compared to what we have here. Uh, Malaysia does a lot of medical goods na we only wish we could do here locally also. So these markets are, you know, are growing and growing also, no, it's talaga very sophisticated. Indonesia, because of its size of its economy, uh, it's getting there, no, uh, especially in recent years uh, with the explosion of tech in Indonesia. Talaga ang daming mga uh, solid players there, no, uh, and they they are also present here, no. Uh, Gojek unfortunately has tried to come in here. Yeah, Gojek yung kanilang angkas, no, at yung kanilang mm-hmm. grab na uh, hindi naman nabibigyan ng permit ng eh, LTFRB, but they've been trying to enter the Philippine market. Um, so, and you also have, you know, I think Traveloka, Tokopedia, these are all like large Indonesian companies, no? That, uh, yung tawag nilang unicorn, no? Yung mga 1 billion and above uh, mm-hmm. dollars valuation. So, mm-hmm. talagang, you know, the tech sector there is very dynamic already and will continue to do so. Kasi nga, uh, like the Philippines, it's also a developing country, so there's still a lot of in efficiencies there no na malaki pang maitutulong if they could really leverage on more digitalization and more tech so yun and of course vietnam is not far behind they're also galloping away so kailangan talaga natin mag very very fast in fact uh, dean robbie no uh, i i've i've been in the startup scene then no hmm. uh, for the past 15 years no Indonesia, na una sila sa andaming AI technologies. They're Correct. like way ad- way advanced. Tayo na uhule. And mm-hmm. some of the players that I, you know, I've consulted with in the past year, that are AI companies, ang hirap daw penetrate yung Philippine market. Kasi yung regulation. Yep. You know, if you wanna do an, if you wanna sell your services, no, yung AI solution mo. It's so hard kasi ang tagal, di ba? Mm-hmm. Uh, daming uh, regulation. I think that's uh, that's one of the ano, yung challenges ng, ng you know, disruption. If you want to create disruption, pero ang daming ano, yung force field, you know? hindi ka makapenetrate mm-hmm. talaga. Since we're talking about AI mm-hmm. no? and yung ibang e- economies, uh, I want to ask your opinion here. No? Siyempre si Elon, Elon Musk. Uh, uh, you know, very popular. He was in the news like two days ago sa CNBC. He was talking in his plant, Tesla, and then there's an interview. It was uh, trending news then. But I'm not going to touch on that. But he did say in one of his interviews with Joe Rogan that there's an over allocation of talent in finance and law no basically too many smart people go into finance and law mm-hmm. but there's few people really going into innovation you know entrepreneurship and basically that's what he's saying no to make innovations pos- possible you need you know more entrepreneurs no and what what what's your what's your uh, reaction to to that comment especially ngayon diba uh, tapos na yung school yung mga ka- papunta na silang college uh, ano yung view niyo uh, doon sa comment niya well that's very true no matagal nang sinasabi yun about the philippines no that uh, we produce uh, too many lawyers not enough engineers no um, and so kaya dumadami ngayon red tape and just to go back to your earlier point about the red tape uh, you remember lang no um, in the transport sector right when Grab and Uber first came into the market talagang sobrang na-disrupt yung taxi industry um, and we were so happy kasi suddenly uh, you know it doesn't matter the time of day kung maulan biglang through your phone makakakuha ka na ng sakay no? and of course many people invested in cars so that you could you know, become an Uber driver or a Grab driver. And then uh, at the onset, LTF February was very 
lax and they actually la- allowed this new disruption in the market to flourish. And then the regime changed, the LTFRB board changed, and suddenly, dinagdagan ng red tape. They put cap on how many cars uh, are allowed. They, you know, they basically started penalizing Wonder. No, Wonder was a car pulling up to the point that Wonder exited the country. Um, they wouldn't let Gojek in. Um, even in the motorcycle side, they were putting all sorts of, uh, you know, all sorts of rules about whether, you know, Habal Habal was allowed or not. So, um, so Yun, that's just the transport sector is one main example where, you know, you have a disruption and then it starts, you know, eating the market share of incumbents. And then the incumbents start pushing the government to clamp down on this disruption. And sino did they have, though, yung, yung consumer? So today, um, yun, you have Grab. If you're lucky, sobrang niya siyang mahal. If you try to get a Grab during rush hour, minsan ang tagal bago ka makakuha ng kotse. Um, so it was very different from before. And many of uh, the people I know who used to have Grab cars had to sell these cars kasi hindi na sila makakuha ng license from LTFRB to operate. So you have this kind of system in place in the Philippines where, you know, tech tries to come in and the government sees it first as very good and beneficial and then pag nag-complain na yung mga incumbent na wala namang ibang ginawa, na maayos, um, then they just, you know, use regulation to just, you know, delay the entry of markets. No, So yun talaga yung um, very sad about the way uh, we are able to really prevent the entry of tech in the country. No? Sorry, napa-excite ako dun sa sinabi ko, nakalimuta ko na yung tanong mo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's true, no? Pero ikaw, um, may pag-asa pa ba? <laughs> so, yeah, so, you're all Philippines. <laughs> yeah, so, so what's good now is that you have many tech companies that are very much more open to tech. Uh, so BSP, for example, is one, no? So the central bank has really provided a lot, oh, not a lot, no, but provided more frameworks around open finance, which uh, you know creates a mechanism for data sharing, which will then enable more fintech to come in. No, uh, they're creating like regulatory sandboxes, para some fintech companies can try out their different modes of providing, you know, new financial products. Kasi nga ang hirap umutang dito sa Pilipinas, eh. malaking sakit ng bansa. Ito, so if someone can utilize your credit score, your the information on your phone, the information from your social media to try to see kung pwede ka bang pautangin o hindi. And if that opens new avenues for lending, especially for people that have been eased out of the banking sector, di napakaganda, di ba? And in fact, that's what Gcash, Paymaya, Tonic Bank, and all these uh, new companies are trying to do, no? They're trying to really pr- get not just your savings, but also provide you with loans in different new financial products, no? Whether it's an SME loan, whether it's a housing loan, na before mahirap siyang makuha. So, yun yung, um, you know, that's the good thing. And of course, the government in the past few years passed a number of uh, new laws. Uh, so, you have the innovation acts that were passed, no? Dalawa sila. That actually provide funds for DOST, uh, DTI, and DICT, and even NEDA, no? To fund money for startups, no? And even a number of LGUs. We work closely with Quezon City. So, Quezon City is giving away, you know, grant money to the startups that it feels, you know, has legs and can come up with more jobs for the people of Quezon City. So, talagang, now's the best time to actually enter this field. Kasi you now have many entities, especially NEDA, Central Bank, DTI, that's really pushing for startup development. DOST is funding all sorts of tech incubators. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, Ateneo tech incubators had grant has grant money from DOST. No? Salamat. Uh, so it's really, you know, creating a big push towards innovation. Kasi nga, um, the government finally realizes that the next wave of jobs will come from this sector. Uh, oh, and that's really a way for us to dear. get out of our current structure. Because if you look at why the Philippines is not growing, uh, many of our industries kasi are dominated by large conglomerates. I agree. Uh, um, diba? Usually in a place where you have multiple 
uh, competitors in the Philippines you have one or two right so sa telco pa lang no the buy only have two players so uh, the government's been pushing for more new telcos to come in uh, so they of course gave license to uh, you know to um, dito no yeah. and they're also trying to help the other entities that have existing telco licenses no uh, to try to speed up their rollout of especially internet services so talagang there's a big push towards technologies that you hadn't seen previously so hopefully uh, you know the new companies will really be the ones to destroy the competitive advantage of the incumbents and really force them to become more efficient that's good to hear kasi yung mga ganung news actually you don't hear them eh. that the, the government it has initiatives to fund you know yung mga startup ideas you don't hear them in the news eh. so Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm glad there's such a thing like the DOST and NEDA also, no? Uh, yeah, in pushing. fact, Quezon City just awarded three of our Ateneo incubated startups uh, ah. with grant money. No? So, talagang, this partnership between the government and the academe and the industry is, you know, growing and growing. So, sana nga magtuloy-tuloy siya. That's so, why we met in the IBPAP meeting, no? Kasi nga, oh, yeah, yeah. To- become more visible in the sectors that are okay. most high-tech. And that's, that's really the BPO sector kasi kung tutuusin mo, um, HR, payroll, finance, a lot of these things are being conducted here. No, The large companies do most of their payroll here, their HR. So yung mga HR systems ng mga BPOs, yun talagang world-class na they do a lot of AI. They use AI, for example, to to interview, to screen, may mga chatbot yan, even before ChatGPT uh, exploded, no, they would already use uh, AI to really help screen and train their new hires. Kasi especially if you talk about this sector. Talaga? They hindi, hire hindi hundreds of people ano, a day. Ah. Eh. Ano? Talaga? Hindi, parang hindi yan na-highlight sa IB, Papa. So, meron na pala. <laughs> <laughs> Kasi tinatanong ko yan eh. Oh, Baka ah, trade oh, secret ka rin siya. Ah, kasi the issue is kasi, um, so ang difference kasi ng BPO sector, and I, I saw this firsthand when I was in AIM, kasi kung kami sa Ateneo or sa AIM before, nag ng tao, pa isa-isa, di ba? may isa kang job opening, yeah. marami na siguro yung lima, and then of course you go through the screening process of a company where, alam mo yun, you have 20 resumes, babasahin mo isa-isa, papainterview mo sila, so kaya-kaya siyang gawin. But during that time, I forget that one of the BPOs was also using AIM's uh, ballrooms for hiring. So sila ibang level. Kasi kung kami nag ng lima, sila nag ng isang daan. Mm. So para makakuha ng isang daang uh, call center agent, you have to interview thousands of people. So, or at least screen resumes of thousands of people. So, ang ginagawa na talagang malaki ang test. So, parang mm-hmm. every day you'd have 50 people at a time coming in to take a test. And then, may ibang silang mga screens. And now, pahirap na rin pahirap ng gawin yun kasi they're trying to scale even further. So, of mm-hmm. course, they're going through more AI screens, pang screen ng yeah, resume, yeah. Uh, pang screen ng interview, uh, mm-hmm. pang screen ng mga essays na sinusulat nung tao, even the way they can see if you know, with a voice clip kung maayos ba yung English mo. Um, kaya na yun ng AI. Kasi if they have to do an English test for every single call center agent applicant, maubusan sila ng time. That's true. So, and you realize that this is happening here in the Philippines. It's not happening in like some strange uh, foreign land. Siyempre. Siyempre, so, siyempre. yun. So, kita mo na itong seeds of disruption already here. It's just mm-hmm. a matter of you know, scaling them up faster and bigger. We're talking about AI, no? So let me go straight to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, dito sa Komita Journey, we've been talking about AI. We've gone through some walkthroughs on ChatGPT and other AIs, no? Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your thoughts about generative AI, which is mm-hmm. ChatGPT? There are different types of AI kasi, di ba? So merong isang for analytics and iba-ibang mm-hmm. applications, no? Yep. Uh, what are your thoughts there? And um, major concern kasi is because of this gener- generative AI, there are fears that jobs will 
ma-affect and syempre industry is a service driven eh, no? may pagka service driven industry tayo so your thoughts well there's no doubt that many jobs hindi naman will disappear but will change uh, but of course some of them could disappear no uh, so for example um I, uh, I'm a chat GPT subscriber. I have to admit that. Same and here. It's now become very easy for me to draft essays, proposals, even draft. So, kunyari, we want to create a workshop for you. Let's say you request, uh, Komita request for you know us to do a workshop for you. If you give us the theme, chat GPT can spit out the yes, you know the uh, the workshop. Because in three days, it will even say. You know, ano yung session from 9 to 9.30, 10 to 10.30. Parang, pati yung schedule ilalagay niya. And of course, each part of the curriculum that we will present, no? And it's good especially for idea generation. Kasi, mapapa, even things that you hadn't thought of, lalabas siya in five seconds. It's still very, very inaccurate. But we know that will change very, very fast, no? Um, because if you feed the, the model with data, no? So for example, some of the things we're trying to do at uh, at Ateneo, is that if you feed it, uh, let's say our student handbook, uh, can it actually answer questions of students accurately based on the handbook? No. So, for example, ano ba yung rules namin on attendance or on grades or on enrollment? Um, if you feed it the enrollment data, syempre, it must spit out niya yon. So, parang it the myriad of applications that it will generate is. Hindi mo man maisip pa ngayon kung ano yung kaya niyang gawin. And um, one of the things we started asking internally no, no, uh, in the university is, ano yung maapek niya? And what we found interesting is that ang akala namin kasi ang unang tatamaan would be our programs uh, in computer science. Kasi syempre, a lot of the coding uh, can now be done by ChatGPT. No, even pag, yeah. ano tawag doon? Uh, pag may error na lumalabas, pwede mo tanungin sa chat, di ba? But nag error yeah. it will actually help fix your code. So, a lot of the things that we used to teach our students, you know, I don't know how much longer they'll be applicable. Uh, right? So, may mga ganun siyang concerns. But what we didn't realize, ang una pala niyang tatamaan, is our programs around art and creative writing. Kasi especially if you put in you know, um, yung mga mind, ano tawag doon? Mind journey ba? The mid journey, sorry. Mid journey. The, Painting, diba? yung, yung the images, to, image creator. Create images. So suddenly, it becomes very easy for someone to actually create a new image. Uh, mm. Basta magiging lang siya gumawa ng prompt. And it's harder mm. to tell kung ano yung gawa ng studyante at ano yung gawa ng AI, especially for, you know, uh, creative writing and the like, no? Um, and at what point is writing creative and yung mga issues like that no which since everything is new we're all dealing with it uh, mm. you know as we speak and we're now crafting rules depending on the class kung up to what extent we can allow ai to be used kasi iba ibang sitwasyon iba ibang gamit swerte ako kasi i teach you know leadership and strategy so, parang for strategy, for example, um, it still can't analyze a company for you. Uh, mm -hmm. You still have to do it yourself. But it's, we're probably a few years away for you feeding it an annual report and it's spitting out, you know, a full-fledged new business plan, no? Um, so, who knows how quickly our, our lives will be disrupted. But at least for now... Um, we know that there are still many things that a human is necessary for. So, for example, in strategy, the or marketing, no, the chat GPT can give you a marketing plan, but the insights as to whether the marketing plan will work or that your strategy is actually novel enough that it can actually beat your competitors. Ta operate lang may kainon, ni ba kain ng AI so far. So. What we try to do is try to see ano ba yung bagong learning capabilities na kailangan na namin itulo sa estudyante. Kasi we know that if we ban AI in the classroom, that's gonna be a detriment to the student 
That's true. Kasi yung ikalalabasan naman nilang job market ay AI enabled. Yeah. Yep. So mm-hmm. parang if it's like teaching them to solve you know regressions in a calculator when alam alam naman natin na gagamit yan ng statistical program paglabas no. So but mo siya tuturuan. I mean of course you, sometimes you need them to learn the fundamental basics. So we just need to figure out when it's useful for the learning process and when it's not, no? Because even mm-hmm. in our art classes or our creative writing classes, it's the ability of the student to distill kung ano yung maganda, ano yung creative. So pwede mo kasing gamitin yung AI as a tool for brainstorming, for, you know, for giving you new ideas, fresh perspectives. Pero yung mismong pagsulat ng magandang at bagong essay, sa tao pa rin yun eh, hindi pa yung kaya ng AI. Mm. That's true, that's true. Eto, just want to share some some highlights from Sam Altman, the the CEO of uh, ChatGPT. And you were saying something about programming, kasi kanina, no? And and the reason he said that in his interview. Uh, sorry, sorry. Na, I sure, sure, sure. I said. I, I said oh, no, no problem. Okay, go ahead. I did that. <laughs> so. <laughs> I want to share with you Sam Altman. See, Sam Altman is the CEO of ChatGPT. Yeah, he used to work with uh, Elon Musk no? uh, during the initial stage. Anyway, during his interview, he was saying when ChatGPT you know, was live na, and the coders are using it, they were afraid. They were afraid that they would lose their jobs as a programmer. No? But they found out that oh, this is Sam Altman uh, no, narrating his story yeah, na mas napabilis yung trabaho kasi hindi lang naman yun ang gagawin niya. <laughs> Sobrang daming work. Di ba? And this is also connected to what Elon Musk is saying. No? So Elon Musk said in a TED Talk interview that we will eventually live in a place of abundance and there's so much work, sabi niyan. Sobrang daming trabaho hindi natin nagagawa. Sobrang daming problems like climate change. Diba? Sinabi niya yan. Eh. And all these things na hindi natin masosolve. So we need to solve them. And then once we, you know, we will reach that parang golden age no, of abundance. Everybody, yung poverty is down, di ba? All that. And we will have AI uh, to thank for. Pero I don't get what yung sinasabi nila na dangers of AI. I I hmm. tried exploring it, pero parang I, I don't see, aside from the job, uh, losing jobs, ano yung mga nakikita mo uh, dangers of AI? So let's start with the benefits first, no? Uh, so personally, this is how I've used ChatGPT, no? So um, as I mentioned, no, um, we need to infuse more of our courses with data analytics kasi... Uh, you're seeing it permeate all the industries. So, for example, we work now closely with uh, Robinson's Retail, no? uh, John Gokhmui School of Management. Nga kami. And we are seeing in their operations that they track you know, every single item that goes through their systems. And if you're able to harvest all the supermarket level data or the hardware store data, you can really come up with new products and services that will benefit your consumer and also the suppliers that come in because they also want to sell more goods through your system. So, what used to be a very low-tech industry, no? Pagtatakbo ng, pagpapatakbo ng supermarket, right? Where we thought na, ah, you're just stacking shelves and you're, you know, you're, you know, just working with, you know, suppliers here and there and making sure they're happy and that the merchandisers are there to make sure that, you know, you know maganda yung kitang-kita yung mga labels ng produkto, etc. No? But today, it's really now a more high-tech business. And that cuts across practically all uh, trades, no, including Sari Sari stores. So we even work with companies like Packworks that you know provide a way to track inventory for Sari Sari stores. So all industries now are very data driven. So because of this, even an old person like myself, I need to understand how to program. So I started to learn R, which is one of these large, uh, at least for statistics, no, because when you have to work with big data, R is one of the good ways of doing it, but I've never worked with this program before. So, a way to do that in the olden days, meaning in 2022, is manunood ko ng mga YouTube videos. 
and you know which is helpful naman kasi madami sila and then it gives you a step by step way of learning R no so it will give you uh, you know step by step bibigyan ka pa niya ng map data para pwede mong paglaruan ang problema dito if you're trying to do something by yourself online and with just a video tutor pag nasa stuck ka sa problema um, hindi mo alam kung ano gagawin so of course when you're trying to learn coding or programming or even a statistical software like R no um, para pa nag error anong gagawin ko because many times the error are just caused by extra commas or extra periods or hindi mo alam dapat pala capitalized yung isang word na hindi mo kinapitalize um mag error na siya so what ChatGPT allows you to do is uh, send the error message into their portal and say wait bakit to nagkamali if I wanted to, you know, import the data properly or do this statistical technique that wala naman siya dun sa tutorial, paano ko siya gagawin? And ChatGPT, especially in this domain, no, is almost like a personal tutor where you ask it a question using human language. No? Literally, <laughs> anong gagawin ko ngayon? Ito yung error. It will actually spit out the solution for you. And so, ikakat and paste mo na lang back into R and you actually can start doing more things. So this phenomenal personal tutor is just one of the many, many ways that it can really enhance productivity. You know, we already talked about it can help you, you know, draft emails, it can help you create proposals, it can help you uh, create tests, etc. No? In fact, we're even testing out a new AI bot in Ateneo where if you feed it uh, some of the early papers of the students, it can actually give you tips on how to improve it. So, and dami talagang ways by which, you know, we can enhance the way we teach our classes and enhance the learning process. So, that said, marami naman siya talagang um, potential pitfalls. And we also have to be aware of that. And the nice thing about all of these discussions about AI today is that parang we're more afraid of it uh, now. So, parang, I don't know, it's because maybe we watch too much science fiction. Yes. But, um, pero maganda <laughs> nga eh na hindi na Aware hindi, tayo eh. Yes, aware tayo. And at least early on, we're trying to head off these problems. Kasi for sure, the dami siya. One way, of course, is uh, fraud. So, um, you've seen DeepFake, which is the AI tool that can recreate your face. You can see how AI with just five seconds of your voice can actually create a, a voice modulator that sounds exactly like you. So, ang dali na gumawa ng ng na, alam mo yung mga scam sa yeah. messenger or sa telepono yeah. na ipitext ka nung friend mo na na-hack yung uh, yung yung account mo no and they'll say help kailangan ko ng pera di ba and then you send money and then yung pala na-hack lang siya so the way around that before is to give that person a call right tatawagan mo siya and pag narinig mo na hindi siya yung bosses he don't give the money but if you have an AI tool that allows someone, anyone, to copy your voice, and lalo na ikaw, Christian, you broadcast your voice in a podcast. So, ang dali kopyahin yung buka at yung, uh, yung boses mo. So, we are, and ang Pinoy pa naman, madali mahulog sa scam. So, you are now faced with scarier, more sophisticated scams, no? Uh, if we're scared of all the phishing things that we're already getting in our mga text messages na nagtatanggap mo sa isang araw, no? They could become more and more real, so that's one really scary part of AI. No, is that all of the safeguards that we had before, like like uh, you know like uh, you know passwords, encryption, uh, mas madali na siya break with yeah. AI. So we'll have to find other ways to protect our data, to protect our money, diba? Na it's so easy for it's it's gonna become easier for our systems to be hacked. With That's AI. a very good point. You know, I very, think one major danger. Scary. And the other part is um, the AI kasi tinatawag nila madala siya mag-hallucinate. Hallucination ba yung tawag doon? Where it gives you uh, very ba? strange responses. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and sometimes they border on offensive, racist, etc. Because especially large language models, they're based on all the data that it's fed into the model. Okay. So, if you're trying to create an app, for example, that scores people's credits, um, 
And if all of your data is based on, let's say, um, uh, you know, Western notions of creditworthiness, so ma- baka imbis na you open more markets for credit, you actually might close them off to sectors because their data is not there. No, So especially in the Philippines where many people are not online, we don't have much data on, let's say, indigenous people or on, you know, uh, people who have no access to cell phones. Um, so parang the data that ChatGPT has on the Philippines is very skewed towards uh, people of class ABC, probably mostly in Metro Manila, Cebu, and our other cities. No? So imagine yung data set niya is very skewed. So kaya siya mag no? Because it might only talk about what people in Manila are talking about, not realizing that you know, the people, hindi man Davao, eh. Davao is of course very urbanized, no? the people in like the hinterlands of the Cordilleras or deep islands of Tawi-Tawi, no? who have no access, baka sila yung close out or baka, you know, we say all the biases that Filipinos yeah. have, no? lalabas dun sa chat. No? For example, you know, there's a lot of underlying you know, anti-Muslim sentiment that unfortunately still exists here. Uh, you still have a lot of anti-poor sentiment that exists in certain um, areas of the internet, no? So, mm-hmm. kung ganon. So, my fear din na AI will magnify some of the negative parts of being Filipino. No, uh, There's a lot of, you know, uh, anti-non-Christian, anti-foreign uh, sentiments, especially in the deeper recesses of the web. So... And Janet, eh, because it's there, it's part of the AI. So, kung magtanong ka ng mga tanong about, you know, these places, may bias, eh. Uh-oh. May bias against yeah. them. So, now especially that you're seeing, let's say, peace hold in Bangsamoro, for example, diba? And in fact, you're starting to see many vloggers uh, going to places like Sulu, Basilan, Tawi-Tawi, places we've never seen before. I like right? perception. So imagine all of the text from the past 20 years that are online about bombings, terrorism, etc. Uh, that's there. So if you have a chat GPT asking, should I go to Basilan? It will say no because mm-hmm. it will talk about the behavior. Of the yeah, 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 yeah. Even if the you know the place has become much more peaceful today. So yun yung problem din ng AI that if that becomes a bigger part of decision making by people, by companies, yung biases inherent in the data, mm-hmm. especially data that's old, uh, biases against uh, data that's new or data that's from sources like the people of Basilan who don't have as much access to the internet as the people of Manila. That's true. That's true. I'd like to comment on that, uh, uh, Dean Robby. No? Kasi ito, ito yung sagot ni Sam Altman. Eh. Kasi, mm-hmm. you know, sa states, di ba, may Republican. Eh. Di ba, nag-away, away. And syempre, media, con- yung Democrat basically mm-hmm. controls the media. No? Mm-hmm. So, yun yung concern. Yun yung concern sa ChatGPT. And this is his response. Ah. Sabi niya, ang future of ChatGPT raw. And this is in reaction to yung fears then uh, baka bias or may preconceived notions, di ba? Ang sagot niya, in the future, the vision for this AI system is to, uh, parang it's customized by the country. Let's say per region will have its own settings and eventually you'll have your own setting as well, no? So, syempre, it will learn. So, eventually, yung chat GPT, well, there will be a branch in in Philippines, mm-hmm. tapos ito yung rules niya. So, again, ayun yung gusto daw niya mangyari. Pero ngayon, you do, you, we don't know. Eh. <laughs> we don't know if it, if it will reach that stage. But that's a, a good discussion point. Yeah. Ito, okay. Go, mm-hmm. go, continue. No, that's... Uh, in essence kasi, um, in the future, uh, once these LLM models uh, start becoming more sophisticated, Parang ang laban na niya yung data eh. Kasi mm-hmm. if you have data that no one else has and you feed it to these models, then you will generate insights that no one else has. Right? And so kung malinis yung data na pinapasa mo sa chat, maayos yung mga insights na lalabas. 
Uh, pero unfortunately, much of the data there is garbage. Uh, and it's not because it's designed that way. It's just because the internet is so big, internet, eh. so unfiltered. And uh, yun, kung ano yung pinakamaraming voices, yun yung marami. So, dami nan, if you see a lot of the readings in the US especially, no? yep, yep. we're talking about the anti-black uh, bias of AI. Kasi nga, most of the reports and the pictures and the photos online are all white. So, if you're black, okay, like... <laughs> oh, mas, mas malaking chance na hindi ka acceptable dun sa mm. mga tinatanong mo. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's the bias yeah. kasi and it's, partly it was designed, hindi naman siya designed that way, no? Pero dun kasi nag-umpisa eh yung mm. data, right? Especially if you have, you know, newspaper article clippings that go into the far into mm. the past, no? So, eh, yeah, yeah. talagang racially tinged naman ang America for yes, decades, yes. no? So, yan yung data na naman ng internet. Yeah. Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, basically. correct, correct. Yan yung concept so, niya, no? In the Philippines, you can just imagine ano yung data na nandyan, no? So, there's a lot more data about Manila. There's a lot more data in English. Um, there's a lot more data by rich people, by the middle class, um, by corporates. So, the people who are not part of that click. Uh, yun. So, yun din yung ano. So, ang takot lang kasi natin na uh, yung exclusive society that we have, no? Where you have gated communities, where you have gated schools, where everything is gated, no ID, no entry, di ba? Um, that hopefully will not be replicated in the AI world. Kasi yung mga taong walang phone, walang ID, walang, walang email, sila yung hindi makikinabang dun sa AI kasi wala yung data nila. That's true, that's true. Okay, we're entering the last few uh, questions here. No? I'd just like to ask you, uh, four days ago, and in fact, yesterday, there's a, a news that's picked up here, a total approved foreign investment pledge, I think around 172 billion pesos. What makes the Philippines an attractive you know, destination to receive such, uh, such an amount? Well, um... Marami naman, no? Of course, uh, many of these investments are in the BPO sector, the knowledge process outsourcing sector, kasi nga, you have a very large market of English speakers. And it's not just our English anymore, no? It's our ability to do accountancy, engineering work, uh, law, uh, medical transcription, animation, etc. No? So a lot of the services especially are being outsourced here and are continuing to be outsourced here. So that's still a major... Um, you know, source of investments for us. And manufacturing is also growing. Uh, also because we have a very large local market, no, that's becoming wealthier. So, of course, many more people want to build in the Philippines to serve the Philippine market. So, I think these are the two key areas of growth. And, of course, you have this other push towards infrastructure. So, kita nyo naman when you go out, kulang kulang yung ating mga kalye, ating mga cell towers, ating mga um, power plants, peers, etc. No? So all of these things need to be built. Uh, many of the more exciting um, technologies around this space don't exist here. And, you know, case in point pa lang, no? yung Mactan Airport, no? that was a partnership between, you know, a local and a foreign company. At talagang the way that the Mactan Airport was recreated, it quickly became our best airport, no? thanks to foreign investments. So more and more foreign investors Stores are also looking at the Philippines. So you have people like Starlink. Uh, you have the, you know, the the Japanese subway that's being built, etc. No, so talagang uh, our infrastructure needs are so big uh, that I think that's also a key area of of growth that will be there. And hopefully, we also get more investments in agriculture because I think that's also an area where you know food security is becoming a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. And the Philippines is actually very low tech in terms of agriculture. And we're not talking about, you know, hydroponics and aquaponics, yung mga ganyan. We're just talking about simple things like agriculture, like greenhouses, like irrigation, like, um, you know, even using more high-tech seeds and high-tech, um, you know, mechanisms to transport vegetables. Um, ito, no? So if you have more companies that are hopefully investing in these sectors, kasi, you know, we have a growing economy, we have a growing, uh, you know, population, we all need to eat, we need to wear clothes, we need to walk, we need to drive, we need uh, electricity to survive. So 
alam mo yun. So, uh, it's very attractive to foreign investors kasi ang dami natin. That's true, that's true. In fact, our last two episodes was about agriculture and agri-tech eh? and the need to, there's so much uh, opportunities there. No? Here's my last question. No? Since any uh, last word uh, of advice or strategies for people like me who mm. may have a may have a startup or still considering starting a new business na hindi naman tech no hindi mm. tech enabled pero they want to start is this a good time and what's your advice or uh, strategy or motivational uh, inspirational thought that you can share to 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 our audience today so it's really the best time to do it because one the government is throwing out the red carpet and when i say red carpet it actually comes with money right so for the first time the government is willing to put in money at both the local at the national levels no uh, to really promote startups because it also knows that that's really the next wave of where our economy will head and secondly um we did a large change in ateneo to our programs because uh, while we do have our BS IT entrepreneurship program, no, which is our startup course, and that's really been creating student startups, no, we also tried to push all of our other more traditional programs, like our BS management program, to really head more towards tech. We gave them a longer runway, we gave them more resources, we gave them, you know, speakers that talked about tech-enabled enterprises. We even had, you know partnerships with Kubo and Kaya founders so that they could really present their, you know, their services, their incubation tools, their ways of, you know, ideation and market valuation and, you know, validation uh, systems into the classroom. And we started to see how quickly the students responded, no? They came up with all sorts of amazing ideas uh, that hopefully they will continue to pursue. Uh, they saw places like you know, agriculture and fisheries, construction, uh, restaurant, retail, um, supply chain. Na talagang it's very ripe for disruption. No? So they've come up with a number of different really solid ideas. And the difference now than it was before is now there are many venues by which they can really continue on their entrepreneurship journey. right? So you have entities like the Manila Angel Investors Network. Uh, that have their own, you know, uh, pitch days, right? Where if you have a very good idea, they can put you in front of angels who would be willing to invest their money on the spot, you know, if they think your idea has legs. Uh, Ateneo is not the only one that has an incubator facility. It's practically, you know, a necessity across all of the different schools. So even just along Katipunan, you have UP and Miriam also with their own incubators, uh, you know, PUP has its own incubator. Um, and there's many other incubators that are not even attached to the academy. So um, it's like the ecosystem is becoming more and more developed. And what's different now is that because the money is here and the attention is here, we're hearing that in many of these investor pitches. Parang even companies from Singapore and Indonesia are pitching here. Kasi um, and yung attention. So now it's really a great time for you know the startups to actually you know put their ideas to work because uh, the ecosystem is now more or less in place you have many angel investors and venture capitalists here uh, and then you have entities like sinigang valley where you know they have mixers they have networking events they have presentations some online some face-to-face -face, where you can really get a feel of what the startup community looks and sounds like. Ang hirap kasi noon, uh, maybe 10 years ago, we were trying to launch this first. Um, parang if you had a great student idea or even a non-student idea, you don't have any mentors, you don't have anywhere to go, you don't have any examples to see. And ambition is really driven by what you see. Eh? That's why many... Uh, entrepreneurs are actually children of entrepreneurs eh? because they see mm -hmm. their parents, you know, uh, setting up their own businesses, you know, succeeding and failing. So, sila rin yung type na because they have a role model. 
uh, they will go and try it themselves, right? But if your role models are people who you know are in the corporate sector or work in government, they akala mo yun din ang dapat mong gawin. Mm-hmm. But now, kasi, uh, with the ecosystem in place, with these communities in place, para and with podcasts like this, no, to get the word out, it's now become more normal for people to see na, oh, there's a way pala to you know to create a startup. There's look at all these new fintech companies. Look at all these new, uh, you know, these new agricultural tech companies, right? And so, a lot of the time. You know these new ideas are now starting to flourish because they now have role models. You now have investors. You now have resources in schools and in you know private incubators where you can get help, mentors, uh, customers, coders, etc. Right? Who can really help you get your startup launched? So, talagang now's the best time. Good. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that. Uh... I meet a lot of people, kasi, no? uh, entrepreneurs, uh, business people, and also students. And I'm happy to hear that you know there's an ecosystem, a very very strong ecosystem that supports each other, and we have uh, all sorts of investors from abroad really looking at the Philippines as the next destination no? uh, of you know new entrepreneurs that are going to disrupt how we do business. So with that. Dean Rabi, maraming salamat for for joining us today. I hope we could meet again and have another series when uh, your time permits. So with that, thank you and see you again, our Kumita Explorers, on our next episode. Thank have you, Christian, day. and thank you also to all the Kumita viewers out there. Salamat. See all you right, next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.